Okay, very good morning, Monday 17th of February, so hope everyone had a, a good rainy weekend. And uh, as per usual on a Monday morning, I look ahead for the, for the week, what have we got on the agenda? Uh, certainly quite a few headlines to get through this morning as well. Um, but one thing, just to kick things off, um, to stress is really two things. One, Monday today is a US holiday, so it is President's Day in America which means markets are closed, shorten hours of electronic trade. So something to just bear in mind when we get into the afternoon session. Uh, and then also it's half term. I'm not sure if you guys are commuted in this morning, but I would say that the general traffic on my commute on the way in was, was less than half as normal. Uh, and that is quite a reflection for generally markets because, you know, in UK, for example, you do actually see a lot of people out of the, the workplace and that can have also ramifications just generally uh, on volumes. But ma mainly it's about the US afternoon, which is a holiday. So do uh, bear that in mind with your strategies for today. It could be slow going, barring anything unexpected a bit later on. For this morning though, uh, obviously we're gonna update on the, the virus quite a lot of news about China from over the weekend to get you up to speed on. Also Japanese GDP came out uh, and that's caught a few headlines. A quick word on the UK economic data and then a review for the week as a whole. Uh, but getting things off to a, a start, let's have a look at the charts more broadly speaking and equity index futures are on a positive footing. Uh, subsequently the US 10 year down just a touch about four ticks on the bottom right and gold down about three and a half dollars. Uh, so some moderate risk on type of environment. Uh, this does come despite a very uh, eyebrow raising Japanese economy contraction of some 6.3%. And I wanna kick off with that actually, because when I generally when I come into work, one of the things that I do is I scroll through Twitter just to get a general sense of some of the main headlines and what people are saying, opinions and so on. And uh, there was a lot of uh, negative kind of interpretation from this print where Japanese GDP uh, overnight the release showed the economy shrunk by 6.3% annual rate versus expectations of a fall of just 3.8% uh, in the fourth quarter after last autumn's rising consumption tax impact weak global demand and typhoon disruption all weighing on their economy. Um, so as I said, when I was coming in this morning, a lot of people uh, kind of talking this up almost in a sensational way about how catastrophic it is. But you know, con context is king in this respect. And one of the things I wanted to just look at was this, which is the uh, picture of the last what, five, six years of Japanese growth. So this is Japan's real GDP annualized. And you can see the last time they did a, a, a previous tax hike on this left-hand side was going back into kind of Q2, the impact of 2014. So you can see here, quite similar to what we've had. So, you know, if you came in this absolutely blind, you'd be thinking, wow, this is a spectacularly bad print for growth. However, there's three main reasons here. One in particular, the rise in the consumption tax impact, and it's to a similar degree of what we saw previously. <laughs> also, just generally, the environment, the, the weak global demand, as I said, and also the disruptions from weather of which they've had over the surveyed period, all contributing to this. Uh, the other thing as well is about um, what does this mean then for Japan going forward? Well, uh, Expectations obviously rife that the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, after only about two months ago adding a large amount of fiscal stimulus to the system, is probably going to have to consider going for round two in order to support growth because we haven't yet mentioned the virus, of course. And then the Bank of Japan. Uh, this is the Governor Kuroda. He said in local press overnight that would consider more easing if the virus impact becomes big. Um, so that then leads us on to the Chinese situation. Now, these numbers, just to give you an update, total confirmed cases north of 70,000, total deaths now just above or just under 1,800. Now, one of the main things, though, that's been happening is this. And actually, if you look at this chart, this is the CSI 300 index in China, so kind of the biggest companies in China. 
and what we've got here is the entire index has now recouped all of its losses from when we originally closed uh, for the Lunar New Year. So we closed the Lunar New Year basically where that green arrow is, is here and after we had that big gap down in markets you remember in China uh, on the back of the catch-up given the extended closure of their markets to contain that virus in Hubei province uh, we've now recouped all of those losses and in fact overnight um, Shanghai or I'd say Shanghai Composite uh, local markets elsewhere in the region Hong Kong Hang Seng all up up about two percent in fact overnight so despite numbers obviously the, the virus is is getting worse in that respect uh, markets are more focused on well what is going to be uh, the kind of reaction by the government and in what ways are they going to try to counteract this by propping up the government now China's government pumped cash into the financial system they've trimmed money market rates they've offered targeted tax cuts so China said on Sunday they will enact more efficient stimulus measures despite widening fiscal gap including lowering corporate taxes the stock regulator in China on Friday said it would ease some rules for firms seeking to raise extra capital through share placements including shortening lockup periods to benefit smaller cap firms and President Xi called for encouraging vehicle purchases as part of efforts to help the economy last night local auto manufacturers rose more than 10 percent on the back of that comment from Xi also within the region Singapore has promised strong package of budget measures central banks from the Philippines to Thailand to Malaysia have all been cutting interest rates so that kind of explains a lot of why markets are fairly uh, calm at the moment despite the kind of numbers that are accumulating at this present point in time and the kind of general mainstream media and how they are reporting this in a slightly more different more sensational way uh, this was a graphic that I shared in uh, my kind of week ahead piece that I've sent out by email to all you guys uh, but you know all of the things I've just mentioned were just the stuff that China was saying at the weekend but if you go all the way back to, to basically the beginning of the month, you know, this isn't the first kind of fiscal tweak that China's looked to do from injecting uh, large amounts of liquidity into the system through open market operations to supporting key sectors via easing of monetary policy. You know, it's kind of that mantra of whatever it takes. And at the moment, that's why the markets remain fairly sanguine about this whole uh, virus issue, despite obviously the underlying long-term economic impact if this is what's happening the way markets are perceiving this at least for the moment is almost this v-shaped recovery a big hit to, to Chinese growth obviously on the impact of what we've had through late Jan February however given these measures a substantial comeback on the period thereafter moving on then a few other headlines I wanted to share um, obviously a lot of talk about OPEC in recent week or so given the uh, low nature of which oil had been trading given um, the impact on consumption from China and so the net demand on crude oil and I just wanted to have a look at crude oil again this is that familiar chart which I've looked at a number of times which is marking up quite a few of the key price points so if I just remove my camera for one second you'll be able to see the whole thing so as you can see here oil prices have stabilized uh, and this goes hand in hand with what we've just been talking about about the overall market's perception at least for the moment about the handling of the virus being a fairly contained one uh, for the time being so the recovery in the equity markets the all-time highs in US stocks the full reversal in the mainland in Chinese equities the oil market reflects that same shared interpretation Remember, we were threatening around a key level of support from around the summer of 2019. We did get a little bit below there, but we've bounced now a decent amount, pretty much just over $2 back up towards uh, north of a 52 uh, handle for the moment. So um, what does this mean? Well, from an OPEC point of view, I would say there, you remember what we were talking about with the, the strategy of OPEC, as I've got marked up here on the right hand side, Remember, about a week ago, they were, they were verbalizing the necessity to cut 
the current supply agreement by additional 600,000. And that, in, re in tandem with the uh, general, let's say, leveling off or let's say more moderate rise in virus cases has been enough to turn the market around. Um, again, for now, we shall see how long lasting that becomes. So the fact that headlines would suggest then that there's fading hope for an emergency OPEC plus meeting, I think absolutely right. If I was OPEC, particularly if I was Russia, absolutely no need now to have a emergency meeting. Their OPEC official meeting is scheduled for the beginning of March. That's only about three weeks away from, from current date. So I would say as if market prices continue to, to bounce as they are, absolutely no reason then. Um, you can almost rearm your ammunition for, for talking up, again, potential action if we were to come back down again. So if I were them, I would keep them for now uh, and, and save it for another day. Uh, this is just a, a, a graph to reflect that. Uh, this is looking at the price over the last couple of months of oil and you can see oil has actually had its best run this year as the coronavirus hit nerves of, of somewhat calmed. So quite a substantial pullback from where we were um, just through pretty much the most of the period of January. Skipping forward then, let's talk about a little bit for the week and just wanted to mention the UK. Um, I do talk about this in my kind of macro overview uh, in the, the week ahead piece that I've written at the weekend. Uh, that is, I'll share that now, that article in your chat that you can have a read when it's very quiet later on this afternoon. So the first things first, obviously the pound did see a bit of strength towards the back end of last week on the resignation of Saji Javid. The idea being that Rishi Sunak will, will be more aligned with number 10 and look to provide a kind of Trumpian style stimulus perhaps to markets. Um, whether or not that is the case, I don't think you're going to get any immediate details on that. Remember, uh, the budget isn't coming for another couple of weeks. And so I don't think you're going to get much in the way of real concrete details on any type of fiscal changes in that respect this quickly. So I'd say this week then, uh, attention turns back to this, which is the economic calendar of events. So you can see here, I'll make this a bit bigger, but this is what's coming out in the UK this week. Tuesday, you've got the unemployment rate, average earnings, Wednesday, UK CPI, Thursday, UK retail sales, and Friday, manufacturing and service PMIs. So recently, what we've had is a bit of a, uh, a Boris bounce on the securing of that majority government and ability to kind of at least through move through the first parts of delivering of Brexit into this transition phase. And that has been warmly received in terms of economic data. I'm not sure if you saw, I think it was right move house prices again. Housing data has seen a very sharp snap back higher on the back of renewed confidence uh, on inquiries into home purchases. Uh, but generally speaking, the way I perceive this economic data is, is that I don't really foresee that momentum behind the kind of uh, election lift long lasting. And so this data, I think, is going to be quite interesting because sterling currency, as we know, despite the rally uh, last week, still remains relatively precarious in terms of to the downside. Uh, and in the world of generally dollar strength at the moment, where U.S. economic data has been pretty decent, um, sterling or cable like euro dollar, I think, is quite interesting to continue to watch both with generally quite downbeat fundamentals, both in the Eurozone for the Euro, uh, for the pound in the UK, because I think the data and also the impasse of generally Brexit negotiations will outweigh until we get at least any more details, this whole kind of belief about uh, Sunak um, coming out with some sort of fiscal bazooka anytime soon. Um, on that point of Brexit, um, this is happening today. So the UK Brexit negotiator is going to be giving a headline speech a bit later on today. I'm not sure if you, you recognise this chap or not, but that's David Frost. The UK Brexit negotiator will set out Britain's goals for talks over its future relationship with the European Union in a speech from Brussels today. Uh, we know the current status here. The two sides are very far apart on a number of points. So you would be interested to see um, the current status on those talks later. Uh, this was something as well, I mean, I won't go into it too much, but I did want to mention it because you have the Nevada 
uh, caucuses happening on the weekend. This comes after Bernie Sanders won New Hampshire and Pete Buttigieg won Iowa a few weeks ago. So this is the Democratic uh, kind of race for nomination for the presidential uh, pursuit, if you like, going into November of this year. And I just wanted to show what the current markets are predicting. And Bernie Sanders is outright favorite at the moment to win the Democratic uh, nomination. Uh, whether or not that's going to remain the case yet to be seen, the Nevada uh, caucus, I think, is, is a bit of a, a moot point. The biggest one is Super Tuesday. I talk about it a little bit in the week ahead piece, but Super Tuesday, for those not aware of it, is when 16 states or areas basically put forward their nominees. And so that's the big one. People like Michael Bloomberg, uh, the, the business billionaire, uh, he hasn't taken part at all in any of the caucuses so far. He's kind of saving it all for the big day on Super Tuesday, which is kind of the real flagship event. Uh, and whoever comes out on that will be in a very strong place. But my overall assessment of this type of information is, for one, this really is not that important for markets, generally speaking, day to day for the moment. Um, and then two, one thing that's quite interesting here is that the more center ground democratic people, um, so Buttigieg or Klobuchar or Biden, they are all basically fighting with one another, which means there's no real shared consensus within the party behind who to back in the center ground, which by default then is lifting more and more the chances of Bernie Sanders, who is more of an outright socialist and has clarity at least in that political view. Um, so yeah, something to be aware of. It's a lot of, it's getting a lot of US media attention, um, but I just wanted to cover that off. Okay, for the week, other things to look out for and the final parts. So yeah, today, US holiday, President's Day. So no treasury trade. Uh, NYSE as well, closed and short electronic trade um, on uh, CME Globex, so very quiet this afternoon I'm sure. And then going into the overnight, you get the RBA minutes, so if you're looking at the Aussie, then you get the commencement of the UK data on Tuesday on the job side. Um, two of the biggest earnings reports to look out for pre, pre-market respectively in the US, it's going to be in the brick and mortar retailer Walmart, or I should say brick and mortar, more and more they're trying to switch into a little bit more into the uh, to track behavioral changes onto the online space so see how they fare um, still very much a sizable company and then UK earnings FTSE giant HSBC reports pre-market tomorrow on Wednesday um, and this is really there's three central banks minutes coming out this week the RBA tonight you've got the Fed FOMC minutes on Wednesday night and you've got the ECB minutes on Thursday uh, from the Fed and the ECB, I'm not really expecting much, to be honest, and I don't think they're going to be particularly market-moving events, but nonetheless, uh, probably warrants at least watching um, just to, to see how the land lies, particularly with some of the decisions we've had of late with the Fed for the second consecutive month winding down the size of some of their repo operations. And then on Thursday from the UK, you've got uh, retail sales, that's obviously the CPI on Wednesday. Then Friday, a little bit more interesting on the data side, you've got the manufacturing service PMI data. These are preliminary readings coming out from the Eurozone, UK, and also from the US, as long as with a slew of Fed speakers as well. Um, the final point is Saturday, the G20 conference in Saudi Arabia kicks off. So. Um, just giving all the, the gatherings of the heads of state, I'd be interested to see what they have to say about the ongoing impact of the coronavirus, of course. Okay, that is it from me. I'm gonna hand you over to Sam. So I'm gonna switch over my screen. I'm gonna put my camera back on so you can see when he's talking. It should come on now. And I wish you guys a good day. Thanks very much. Hi guys, good morning. Hope we all had uh, good weekends. Uh, we'll have a, a quick look over a couple of the charts to, to start off the day. Might as well go for the currencies to begin with here. And, and you've got euro, small range to begin. I mean, this is <coughs> likely to be the story of the morning, I would suggest. I don't think there's going to be too much going on, let alone in the afternoon. It's going to be 
relatively quiet day. I mean, it's quickly flicked back to that calendar that Ant was on there. It's it's going to be quiet. Um, obviously, if we go to where we are now, UK right move house price index not going to move things uh, very quiet on that front. So looking at that euro, <coughs> just on the the high that we sort of finished, or the height the the highest point we had uh, around eight o'clock on Friday, that's holding up price action for now. I mean, the low that we had in the early hours of Friday is actually only 14 ticks below that level. So a small zone there in the euro to, to keep a, an eye on. If we're looking for that continuation, obviously that zone for that to, to break through, uh, and we're looking for that to, to continue all the way down to some of those levels that, of course, you're going to want to have marked up from back in 2017 if we were to see you know, a bigger push through. You've got initially that low that we're uh, on now, and then Macron's gap around 108. 08, so not actually too far away now from uh, that taking place. If we have a look at this on the, the longer time frame, the weekly, you can see those uh, big couple finishes uh, that we had near those lows as well. But right now trading on the futures anyway, if I just move this out of the camera so you guys can see, right on the low that we had at the week of the 24th of April, that has been tested right now, uh, where we finished days and weeks. Uh, on this point will be really interesting. Is it actually going to be that we're um, you know, not going to quite get down to that gap area yet? Obviously time will tell, but very key level being traded pretty much right now. Uh, for, for the bulls, if you're going to get excited, it's probably not going to be on a Monday US bank holiday. Uh, but if we can get above some of these levels of resistance uh, from Friday, uh, you might just start to feel a bit more comfortable, but I would suggest until we get really above the higher Friday, the lower eight eighty to get long for uh, you know a considerable amount of time. The pound, like the euro, this morning very quiet. I mean, just have a look at eight o'clock and. Uh, it's, it's relatively quiet in comparison. I'm not expecting too much. We have had uh, a couple of highs uh, previous sessions to get lower. So worth getting on a potential trend line for that. You can see we're also getting squeezed in from the uh, the bottom as well. So potential for a bit of a, a low liquidity spike higher or, or lower on that for the pound. Probably overall at the moment would prefer this to put to the upside. So break of the high of the day. Uh, this trend line, potential trend line, I should, I should say, to target the highs that we did have from last week, which you could call a bit of a, a double top, really, with the uh, the high of the fifth in the mix there as well. Aussie dollar, you know, are people still excited about this as, as a medium term uh, long opportunity to have found support on those multi uh, year lows? We'll have to wait and see, of course, but looking at this trend line here from the low of the year we hit that late on friday got to have this on a break of that then this market could well uh, look to come back down and find a bit of support on where we we found a quite a lot of support a lot of buying pressure came in around this area around 6700 uh, and keeping on that trend line guiding price to the upside uh, getting on a bit of a trend from the recent highs as well you can see perfectly getting squeezed here starting on the 5th then the 12th and 13th as well but the Aussie this is all I'm caring about just now a um, couple of months wrap this up and then obviously what I'll do I'll put it on YouTube and I'm sure uh, Sam will, will figure itself out but for the Aussie dollar keeping a, a watch on both of those there really waiting for the break to the upside or the downside, I think, for a more considerable uh, movement there. Overnight, the yen, it, uh, it's like to touch. You'll see the shockingly poor data um, bringing us under pressure. And it's actually, you know, this this market, again, is not doing too much, but very key level support uh, right now. Let's call that S1, Friday's double bottom, bit of support there from Thursday as well. So keep a, a watch on that uh, as well. But the, the market that I want to switch us over to is uh, is the Nikkei, which you can see pushed drastically lower in early trade. But it's already recovered uh, that move. Uh, however, it is some way off those highs that we did have from from last week. So maybe one to, to keep an eye on, on how that develops. 
Uh, I think if you're if you're bullish uh, stocks and you want to see Nick and maybe recover, although I don't necessarily think that's going to happen today. Really, the pivot and these lows from the fifth, the seventh, and then Thursday, Friday. Uh, will be levels to keep an eye on there. Moving over to US, um, just printing a new fresh record high in the S&P. Of course, we're just coming through the European cash open, volume still low, so keep an eye on perhaps what the, uh, the DAX is, is going to do uh, on that, uh, whether we can actually get a decent enough move either way today i'm not too sure um obviously keep a, a mark up on that fresh record high and then really if we just make this a bit smaller i'm going to put this on a 60 minute and you can see we have got a, a series of uh, lows to keep an eye on you can see they're very nicely respected starting here let me just move that out of the way back on that low that we had on the 9th marks up lovely with the 13th and, a, and good enough for me on the 14th that I want to would want to have that on uh, and that could be a bit of a guide going into uh, the week as well lowering the time frame uh, down areas of support around the pivot you've got previous highs call that a zone as well from the pivot to to 3380 that would be a level that I'd be wanting to focus on as uh, an area where buyers could come in and of course that trend line uh, there that I've just talked about oil and gold now uh, oil for me, the finish to last week was, was key, getting above $52 and remaining there is going to be even harder. Uh, but if we do, then the balls are going to be ultimately happy. You can see here just the importance of this level, this zone. Um, I think when you get excited to the upside, 52.50, I think a close above that and, and you can be feel quite com comfortable that uh, this market could push relatively then fast on towards sort of the 44, uh, 41, 54, 41 I should say. So keep a watch on oil. I don't expect again a big move today, low trade, low volume. Um, but if we can you know, clear out that, that high for Friday, then I'm a bit more uh, a bit more excited about a move to the upside. A couple of trend lines in play potentially for, for oil starting on those previous days. Uh, worth having on as well. To be honest, are you going to want to get too involved today? Probably not. US related markets as well, less so. Um, but just ones to keep an eye on a couple of levels that will be key for the week ahead. Gold, after pushing down this morning, just coming back up to test its lows of the day. Let's have a, a quick look elsewhere just to see uh, what's uh, driving prices. You at uh, European equities are just coming under a bit of pressure. Their pivot levels, which you'll see in a moment, could act as support and this pivot level in gold could act as resistance. So just keep a watch on that and how we trade going into uh, the morning. The bigger picture for gold, you can see relatively uh, choppy again for the most part of last week before a push higher on Friday, uh, getting back above 1585, which was pretty key uh, going back here to the beginning of the month. So again, let's have a watch to see how, how that plays through. But if we just take a, a look at 2020 in general, there's no real direction to this market. Yet. I'm not really convinced at all overall direction of the, the next few weeks. I think it's uh, it's still a wait and see kind of approach. It's take each day as it comes. The coronavirus is what it is right now. And, and I would more than be happy not to take anything on longer than you know sort of intraday a couple of those intraday levels to look look at i do quite like the the idea of s1 as a bit of support day if we could have drifted down to there for an opportunity to get long you can see a couple of these trend lines would meet there and of course the s1 and also uh, the higher point before we push higher the on on friday as well so around 1579 uh, is the the level that i like of course resistance wise literally the pivot now and really i'd be paying more attention to 1584.2 uh, and from the high that we had on friday we are of course just drifting lower a touch as well so worth getting on uh, a potential trend line on that quick look at the dax just to, to wrap it up you can see they're just coming down and touching its uh pivot level where you'd expect a, a little bounce on that next key level to the downside uh, I'd have marked up uh, on around 13.731 the high of Friday evening and then it would be S1 but the pivot you'd expect uh, prices to slow down there a bit worth keeping uh, a watch on really how this plays and then those safe havens uh, as well certainly gold uh, and the bun which you'd imagine over the last 15 minutes has pushed higher which it has 
and that's just coming into a bit of resistance now you can see here on the bund quite a key level back on friday afternoon so you're watching here bund through there dax through the pivot could be uh, the the cue for this market to, to continue uh, the last 15 minutes of trade that low in the bund also the low of fr friday and thursday so it's quite a key level there uh, to keep a watch on as usual any questions please uh, do let us know hope you all have uh, good uh, days not expecting too much uh, we'll catch you all later on i hope you all have a good trading week